Coming to you from the greatest city in the world, this is the number one showbiz podcast. It's Talk for Two. Here's your host, Matt Bailey. Hey, thank you, Gary. Let's start, as usual, by thanking Axtel Expressions and the Tangent Bound Network. I am very excited about today's guest. Ken Tucker is a Pulitzer Prize-nominated critic who at one time served as editor-at-large for Entertainment Weekly. He's received two ASCAP Deems Taylor Awards and is currently the critic-at-large for Yahoo News Television. Mr. Tucker talks about what it means to be a critic, why we're obsessed with reality stars, and yes, his appreciation for ventriloquism and its current media renaissance. Here now, with his fresh and inspiring take on all things on TV today, our interview with Ken Tucker. Ken Tucker, welcome to Talk for Two. How are you today, sir? I am great. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Now, what is your official title at Yahoo News? I am critic at large for Yahoo TV. That's awesome. Yeah, and it, uh, I, I, you can't actually. I read a lot of your articles before, and then you wrote an article about uh, one of our favorite art forms on this show, ventriloquism. You wrote a couple actually around the time Paul Zerden won uh, AGT, and then I'm No Dummy was re-released. Um, so I want to dive right in. Why is ventriloquism often not portrayed in the best of light in television and film, and uh, what do you love about it? Well, um, I'll deal with, the, with the, what I love about it first. Yes, please. Um, I just think it's a wonderful um, artistic expression of uh, the kind of uh, comedy that I really like, the kind of the way a ventriloquist can create with his figure uh, a kind of uh, comic to... Uh, uh, two people in conversation uh, with very rapid jokes, really smart uh, repartee back and forth, um, and this vivid creation of life on a stage, which is really utterly unique. There's nothing like it in in entertainment at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to have kind of grown up watching Paul Winchell and um, the Ed Sullivan show, Senior Wences, and and I would and as a kid I would I looked further back to watching like Edgar Bergen and just people I was just fascinated. Sherry Lewis was a big uh, I, I love that show on television, mm -hmm. and I just thought that ventriloquism just seemed like such a magical gift. I was also I'm also interested in magicians and things like that. That that kind of um, instilling in people the belief that something is happening in a way that is thoroughly convincing, uh, it seems really magical to me. Um, uh, and it's really sparked my interest on through, through the years. And I think that over the years, uh, ventriloquism has kind of become a victim of, uh, irony and sarcasm and the kind of general self-consciousness that's taken part in the pop culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so that in a way when ventriloquism is represented in movies, it's often presented as that it's, it's somehow evil. It, 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 um, I mean, Jay Johnson and other people have, have talked about this, that, uh, at certain points in its history, going back to biblical times, but to the Salem witch trials, that, that, uh, ventriloquism was perceived as a, a an almost evil act, uh, the idea of reproducing a voice, uh, uh, from a evil spirit, um, mm -hmm. but and that's carried through in modern times in the portrayal of ventriloquism as somehow the the dummy takes over the ventriloquist, um, just in countless movies and TV shows. Um, it, it's it's a I think that that was an unfortunate turn that pop culture sort of turned it into this kind of something to be feared, um, and which is kind of based on the fact that I, a lot of times. Um, kids, young children are afraid when they first see a, a ventriloquial figure, especially like a wooden dummy that seems kind of like in the same way that a lot of young kids have fears of clowns. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's, that sort of caught on in, in the culture. And I just think it's unfortunate that that's the, the turn it took. And then when you combine that with the idea that ventriloquism, because it's not from say the 1960s, on on to the present day, not a big commercial going concern. 
um, until recent years with Terry Fader and and uh, Jeff Dunham. Right. Um, it, it it it's become a kind of uh, sub genre of show business, and it's perceived as unhip and uncool. And I just think that that's a really terrible uh, way to classify ventriloquism because it's it's such a, a lively and imaginative art, and it's something that I really wish I I do my best as a critic to call attention to good examples of it as as often as I possibly can. Yeah, and I we appreciate that in in the community. It's wonderful when you know a mainstream outlet and you get to put that on there, a mainstream outlet like Yahoo, uh, and you get to talk about it. We really appreciate that. And I, I'm sorry for jumping right in. We should have we should have started with this question: What is a critic? For those listening that that don't understand what a critic does, what if you had to describe your job in in a paragraph, what would it be? Well, I feel that my job is to. Uh, look at things that everybody else is looking at and listening to. I write a lot of TV reviews. I write a lot of music reviews. Mm -hmm. And um, to find the best and most interesting things that I can find and explain why my enthusiasms, uh, I think, could be shared by other people. And then also to look at things when when a, a television show or a piece of music isn't particularly good, to explain why I don't think it's very good. Um, I think one of the critics' most valuable uh, uses these days when there's such a profusion of television shows and so much music out there and so many books to read is to provide a kind of winnowing process to say, this is good, this is not so good, uh, this is something that hasn't been recognized as, as a really interesting television show or, or piece of music, and this is something that's overrated. And I think part of the public's uh, sort of negative association with with being a critic is the very word critic. People think you're always being critical of something in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas I see my job much as a much more as a in a positive way, which is it. it um, one of the be best compliments I can get is when somebody reads a review of mine and they say. I really like that TV show, but I didn't really know how to kind of put it into words until I read your review. And it's like, yeah, that's it. If if I can sort of explain things to people and they read it and they say, yeah, that's why I like that TV show, th I feel like I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. Now, uh and I'm a I'm actually a film and screen studies uh, major, so this this whole thing is right up my alley. Uh, how academic? I mean, obviously your your articles are are very accessible to the general public, but what are the the things you think about when you're writing uh, and you're consuming the media and later going to write about it? How academic do you think about it, and then it kind of whittle it down into layman's language, if at all? Uh I'm I'm sorry, your voice has faded away. Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes the phone can get a little. Uh, uh, I said, what are some of the tools that you use when you uh, when you're consuming media? What are some of the things you think about that you're later going to write about uh, on the when you write write a review? Well, I was uh, I was an English major in college. I studied literature. I was really interested in poetry and literary criticism. And I think when I look back on it, what that prepared me to do was to to think of something uh, in the context of the whole history of the medium. Like when I watch a television show now that's coming on the air, um, I'm not just thinking about what's happening now in 2015. I'm thinking about this show in the whole context of television since the 1950s and kind of trying to make comparisons to things that have happened in the past to provide a context for the reader. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was, uh, I, I started out um, in, in college, I started out writing about uh, music. So I was really interested in rock and roll in the late seventies. And it was a great period to be a, a rock critic because it was the time of punk rock in, in New York city. I would go and see bands like the Ramones and talking heads and oh, Blondie wow. and, and CBGBs and these tiny little clubs. And um, and go and see Patti Smith at St. Mark's in the Bowery. She one night she would be reciting poetry, then the next night she'd plug in an electric guitar and sing. And so it was a very exciting time. And and uh, my idea was to to try to convey my enthusiasm for 
the music and to talk about, and to, at that point in the 1970s, say, this has real roots in 1950s rock and roll. It really has roots in Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. And, and so uh, that's true today when I review a TV show like Mr. Robot, uh, which I really like, mm. or um, uh, something like Mad Men, or it just it shows that, that have a kind of historical context to them where you can point to the, the, the history of advertising in Mad Men or Mr. Robot has a kind of whole genre of science fiction and kind of futuristic uh, television that you can draw upon. I try to place it in a context that people can understand so that they'll say, well, I guess, I, you know, I, I, I like that kind of show, that older show that he's talking about, so I might want to try this new show. Mm -hmm. Where does reality TV fit in that landscape? I know that seems like a left field question, but we had all these years of fictionalized television, and then all of a sudden things like American Idol and America's Got Talent and even you know uh, locked room shows like Big Brother um, c came along. Where do you put that in the history of television? What do you throw that up against? Well, I think that in that reality TV kind of came along at a period when uh, there wasn't a lot of creativity going on in scripted television, and I think that a lot of uh, producers thought that there was both an economic reason to do this, i.e., reality TV is pretty cheap to produce, mm -hmm. and and then also uh, there was a kind of yearning for the public to see more authentic people on television. So in the beginning, I think there was this this kind of idea that American Idol, a show like American Idol, would really find ordinary citizens who would stand in line for hours, audition, and the true talent would kind of rise to the surface. Um, I got to say, I don't think it turned out that way. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, I feel as though uh, a lot of reality TV just became very manipulated reality TV that that is actually behind the scenes quite scripted. Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, to me, uh, when you, I, you're not talking to a reality TV fan here. Right. Um, I have very little use for that. I think in some ways, as a music critic, when I watched American Idol, it really annoyed me because um, I would see all this emphasis on uh, singing properly, having the right technique, hitting the notes. And I would think, hmm, Bob Dylan didn't hit all the right notes. Uh, Chuck Perry didn't hit all the right notes. Exactly. And only yeah. played songs with two or three chords. But this was great, great music. And and to me, it was a kind of American Idol was a kind of betrayal of the of the rebellion and and freedom that rock and roll represented. Uh, so I didn't. I I'm sort of an anti-American Idol fan. Uh, Although I do, I do admit that I watch The Amazing Race. It's one of, one of the reality shows I watch just because I, I guess I don't travel enough and I love yeah. to watch the world go by. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason I bring up reality TV is because another uh, fantastic event, uh, Paul Zerden, won America's Got Talent. And I'm just curious, to me, and, and kind of to the event community as well, but to me especially, it kind of looked like he was, I don't want to say set up to win because I don't want to throw any accusations around, but he was poised to, to you kind of knew it was going to be him from a very early stage um are you not a fan of america of america's got talent in the same way that you're not a fan of american idol um i mean i think i like america's got talent a little bit more and i found it very intriguing when when howard stern came on as a judge because yeah he's so ruthlessly honest as a radio personality. And I thought if he brought that kind of honesty to his critiques would be really interesting, but I was disappointed that the four seasons he was on, he was pretty soft on a lot of the contestants. And in retrospect, I feel that he probably is a smart enough guy that he thought to himself, it's one thing for me to be brutally honest about big name celebrities when they come on the air with me. He, he must have thought dealing with um, kind of uh, performers who hadn't had that much experience in front of TV cameras who were just kind of trying to launch their careers. If he was as ruthlessly honest as he is with a big, big name celebrity, he'd come off as a bully. Um, and when you combine that this season with what I thought was his kind of lack of knowledge of ventriloquism, that he really didn't understand or know that what Paul Zerden was doing, a lot of other ventriloquists have done in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept, I, I just kept noticing that he kept saying, 
this is unbelievably original. I have never seen anybody do this. And I was, and I just felt like, well, I wanted to send him like six YouTube clips showing him <laughs> that, you know, well, here's what, uh, you know, Ron Lucas has done. And here's what Jay Johnson has done. And here's what Dan Horn's done. And here's what Nina Condi has done. Yeah. And it's just, it was just like, it, it, it just seemed a kind of praise that was not in proportion to, to, to certain talents, which is, and I don't want to badmouth him. I, of course. I, I think he's a very skilled performer. And, but like you, I kind of agreed that, when every single time Zerton appeared, um, there was this just outpouring of, you've got what it takes. You're going to go all the way to the top. You've got it. And it was just like, really? Out of all the other people, that was the guy? It just, it does, I agree with you, it did seem odd. Yeah, it was, it's interesting the way they, they kind of foreshadow it without with, and give you kind of, but still give you choice at the same time. I will move on to some other shows. My, um, I, I, Actually, this isn't a show. This is, but this came up in an episode that you haven't heard yet because it hasn't aired. But our listeners at the time you air will have heard um, the Kardashians. I watched your uh, Craig Ferguson interview where you say you can't stand them. Um, yeah. Why are we so obsessed with people that just have no talent? I can't <laughs> figure this out. <laughs> well, I think it's because a lot of people sit around saying, "Well, if they can become famous, I can become famous." There's a lot of kind of identifying with them. And, I mean, the whole idea that the Kardashians are somehow ordinary people seems very, very strange to me to begin with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but but then, then there's that kind of voyeuristic sort of, they're ordinary people. They don't have any real talent. But they're also incredibly rich and incredibly savvy about how to use social media. And I think for a lot of people who are in their 20s, that's a very sort of attractive view of fame, that it's a very easy avenue toward prominence. And I think there are a lot of young people out there who watch the Kardashians and think, well, you know, if, if I you know, did my makeup like those girls do, and if I got on Instagram and put up some pictures and I got myself known out there, I, I too could have a career like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... And I also think that in a certain way, uh, the Kardashians are, are, are throwbacks to old style TV. I mean, really? if anything, uh, yes, because in a way, wow. well, when, you, when you put a camera in front of a family and have them play out their family dynamics, is it really that different from what the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet were doing in the 50s or mm-hmm. any, any number of sort of family sitcoms that used to be just considered sitcoms as opposed to reality TV. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, my daughters have watched the, the Kardashians, and they sit there and they laugh at it as if they were watching a regular sitcom. And I, I'm kind of amazed at that, because it's like, to me, it's just, I, it's just kind of creepy to watch. Um, but, but that sort of younger generation, I think, looks at the, at the Kardashians uh, almost as sort of living jokes. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great way to put it. But how do we put the emphasis back on talent? How does television encourage people with talent in, in other ways than just uh, America's Got Talent? I love Fool Us. I love Penn and Teller Fool Us because even if they know how it's done and you, they didn't fool Penn and Teller, they're still very complimentary of the act. And I think that's a step in the right direction. What do you think? Um, do you mean how how do we get to good good television scripted television scripted or reality? I think I, I you mentioned certain throwbacks and one of the things I missed was stuff like the Gong Show and you know America's Got Talent being a, a sort of the grandchild of that if you will. But then you get back to people just being allowed to um, sh- showcase their talent with very little judgment, like Ed Sullivan. Uh, and you're seeing that in, in what I, I think, uh, fool us. Do you think uh, that's a step in the right direction to getting back to, uh, giving people with actual talent airtime? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's been an attempt this season with that Neil Patrick Harris show, best time ever that wanted, wanted to be a variety show. It, it, it came from a, a, uh, British, uh, TV show, uh, that's immensely successful over there. Um, that's a, basically a talent show. Um, but for some reason, the the variety show, no matter how many times it's tried to be revived in the 21st century, 
it just doesn't seem to catch on. There's just not quite the the right format. And I, you know, I think it would be great if there was an outlet for real professionals, um, not amateurs, to come on a, a show every single week with a an engaging host or a funny kind of host, um, and 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 had that kind of of showcase. I mean, we're living in this time of such a profusion of great quality television, mm-hmm. but most most of it comes from uh, the drama end. Um, you know, I think starting with The Sopranos and kind of building along, there's so many great television shows uh, that um, became more complex, that became as complex and 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 technically proficient as as the movies and that's why i see i think now you see a lot of people who normally would have had movie careers as directors and writers and actors looking to television for the kind of uh real depth of characterization that that only can be found on television Mm -hmm. movies feature films most of them now the, the big hits are these big action blockbusters that have you know very little to do with real acting and emotion and it's a lot about special effects Mm -hmm. and i think that's why you see you know a big name actors moving over to television and appearing in shows like fargo and the americans and the nick and homeland and it's just it's just kind of one great show after another i mean one of my favorite shows this year has been empire and this this kind of behind the scenes of the music industry uh, it's a kind of movie every single week uh, on, on your TV screen. It I, I really think it's a, it's a really uh, uh, amazing thing that we're living in now, this kind of second golden age of television. Yeah, nowhere to go but up, it seems like. And I want to ask, it's one of these things where I've known for a while that I was going to have you on this show, and this is the question for you that has been burning in my uh in my uh, head for a while, but it's kind of a long one, so forgive me as I, I explain myself. Um, you take something like Scandal and Nashville, both of which I love. Scandal has three million likes on Facebook, okay? So they have a larger fan base than Nashville. Nashville has one million on Facebook. But it seems like Nashville has a, a more devout uh, fan base because of the things like the music and uh, that you can download immediately after the episode and the concert tours. Um, but yet Nashville is always on the bubble, um, it, which is it, this this sort of ability to be so passionate about a show is something new in the social media age. But they're always on the bubble, and there would be so many fans upset if if Nashville were canceled. How do we, in this new age of television, reconcile the shows that have a very niche but very uh, devote, uh, devout following um, versus things that have a more broad interest like Scandal? Uh, wh- is there a place for both? There is a place for both because I think that a, a lot of these niche shows, what used to be just shows for a cult following, a, a show like Nashville would have been canceled after its first season just based on its ratings um, 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. But but now, there, as you point out, there are ancillary ways for a show like that to make money. As you, as you point out, after an episode of Nashville airs, you can go to iTunes and download the songs you heard. Um, so, so it's worth it to ABC and when ABC produces that show, so they're also making money. They don't have to go to an outside studio to make money on that show. Uh, a show like Scandal, I think Shonda Rhimes is a brilliant, uh, TV creator and knows how to build a nighttime soap opera that appeals to a very big mass audience. And I think the, 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 what limits Nashville to a certain extent is what its most devout fans love the most, which is the music. That that country music is is very big, but it's not it's not the music of the entire country. It's a kind of specialized music to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. And and I always I'm always encouraging people that that I that I talk to who say you know what should I watch. And, and they say, I'm not a country music fan, so I'm not going to watch Nashville. And I say, well, you don't need to love country music to watch Nashville because it's got the same kind of engaging soap opera storylines that a show like Scandal has. And it just also has music that you'll enjoy. I mean, there are a lot of times when I watch Empire and I think, 
well, let's get on with it. I've heard this hip hop song, you know, five times on this show. Let's get on with the story. Mm-hmm. And and I think that with with Nashville, it's it's almost the opposite. It's like you're you're so caught up in the stories that sometimes you think, oh, my, oh, that's right. There's also good music here. I'm so glad that they went into the Bluebird, and now we're going to hear a song from these people. Yeah. Um, and so I think that you know Nashville has really um, managed to hang on for the number of seasons that it has, it's fifth season now, uh, purely on the strength of that that kind of cult following now has much more buying power than it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And it, it it can survive. And I, I hope that there are more shows like that. I'd be surprised if, if Nashville lasted another season uh, based on the ratings, but it sure has been a good ride for it. Yeah. And I got to, I got to ask, cause I read the article. Are they taking, uh, are they taking your advice, uh, from, uh, from empire? Some of the, uh, the list that you gave of things that they could be doing, uh, in terms of improving their storytelling. Uh, do you see them taking, uh, taking a few cues from you and from empire? I, I don't. I don't flatter myself that that producers read my stuff and say, "Hey, that guy's got a good idea there." <laughs> um, I think that uh, I feel like that Nashville, if they had streamed their storytelling, streamlined their storytelling more, and, and made the show move faster along, and 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 gotten rid of characters that weren't working uh, more quickly, um, that that it really could have gone. Uh, it could have increased its its viewership, uh, but they just. I don't know. I would love, as I, I kind of wrote, I would love once sh- Nashville goes off the air, I want to hear a behind the scenes story about what was going on, what kind of pressure the network was putting on the show to make it more soap opera like or make it more realistic or emphasize the music or de emphasize the music. I feel like every time I watch that show, that there's not one, you, if you watch Scandal, you know that it's the creator of one person, Chandra Rhymes. But when you watch Nashville, you think, there must be 25 people, including network executives, giving that show notes, and it's pulled in so many different directions that it becomes a very sort of disorganized show, as much as I love it. Mm-hmm. I, I And I'm a huge fan of it, too, and I, I agree with you. All right, before we let you go, because we've never had a critic on, I have to... Uh, Play a little bit of a game here with you. Um, I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to give you two titles. Um, I'm going to ask you to pick one over the other, and I, I want to know why. Uh, are you cool with that? Can we do that? Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think I have some uh, interesting pairings here. I think the first one is kind of uh, obvious: Breaking Bad or Walking Dead, and why? Uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, to me, Breaking Bad has uh, such depth of character. It, it, it has such extreme emotions and such delicacy of bringing that forward, which is kind of an odd thing to say about a, 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 a guy who turns into a vicious killer meth dealer. Hmm. Uh, whereas I think that The Walking Dead is a kind of, hey, let's get some zombies every week show. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, uh, I know we were just talking about it at length, but Nashville or Madam Secretary? Um, I I got to go with Nashville. I I I love the music. I love uh, the the characters as much as some of the, some of them annoy me. Um, I'm a big Connie Britton fan. I feel like uh, she could have been even more central to that show. Uh, it's it's just that's that's the kind of show I watch. I really admire Kay Leone, but I wish that Madam Secretary wasn't sort of such a slow pace. So a kind of ultimately tedious uh, drama. Mm-hmm. Let's get into sitcom. Uh, Big Bang Theory or uh, what was the one I had? Oh, Big Bang or Modern Family. You know, it's pretty. It seems to be surprisingly fashionable to put down Modern Family because it, it's won so many Emmy awards, and people say, "Ah, it's not funny anymore." I like watched the the most recent episode last night and laughed a lot. I think it's a really well written show. I think it's a great ensemble show. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, Big Bang Theory is the biggest sitcom in the world right now. It yeah. has the biggest audience, and i got to admire it for that. But even though I admire it, I sit there in stony silence. I just don't laugh. I think that Jim Parsons is a wonderful comedic actor, but it just doesn't make me laugh. I understand. And last one, I, I, think, this one, I think you'll like this one. The Republican Debates or Saturday Night Live? <laughs> 
<laughs> I do like that. Um, <laughs> the, the, here's one case where I think reality uh, is, is superior to uh, fiction. Um, I, I like seeing the real debates. I like seeing those real people. I like seeing them make their their real valid points and their real mistakes. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Saturday Night Live has become a show that sort of just trades on uh, the culture at large and sort of leeches out what it needs to make jokes. And too often, those jokes aren't very funny anymore. So I I, I laugh harder at the, both the Republican and the Democratic debates than I do at Saturday Night Live at this point. <laughs> I understand. And I got to ask, to wrap this up, is there a show on television uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Um, it's two separate questions. A show on television, give us a show on television that nobody is paying attention to, that we should all be watching, and uh, what are your hopes for television 10, 15 years down the line? I know it's two different questions, but I'll let you wrap it up. Um, I think a show that people ought to be watching uh, is uh, The Leftovers on HBO. Uh, I think it's a, an amazing show about, uh, it has a kind of science fiction root about it group of people, a certain segment of the population that suddenly disappears and how the rest of the population deals with that loss. I think it's a wonderfully written drama, and I'm really surprised that it doesn't have strong ratings for, for HBO. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? The second question was, what, do you, what are your hopes as a critic, as, as a lover of television, um, to see in the medium 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Um, I would like to see um, a lot better written sitcoms. I would like to see a more uh, a revival of sitcoms in the same way there's been such a great revival in, in scripted drama. I, I think right now that there's a kind of fallow period in sitcoms, and, and uh, the direction I think it seems to be going that's the most healthy is the kind of comedy central sketch comedy area where Broad City and Amy Schumer are doing such adventurous work. I, I like seeing... Funny women on television is something that we haven't seen in a long time, and I think that's a great trend that I want to see continue. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Ken Tucker. Check out all his stuff on Yahoo News. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for asking me. Thank you, Ken. That was truly an awesome conversation. I had a blast, and we have to have you back next time fall TV season rolls around. Now, that's it for us this week. Next week, we wrap up 2015 with three-time Emmy Award-winning writer of The Carol Burnett Show, Gene Parrott. If there's a classic sitcom you love, chances are he wrote for it, from All in the Family to Mama's Family. It's just it's an incredible conversation with Gene. And Gene's daughter, Linda, who's an accomplished writer in her own right, joins us as well. The two released a pair of books earlier this year and even have some more books coming out next year as well. In the meantime, head over to talk number 4 spellout 2com for even more Talk for Two. Reach out by emailing talkfor2cast at gmail.com and find our group or like us on Facebook by searching for Talk for Two. Tweet us and about us using at and hashtag Talk for Two. A thank you once again to our season sponsors, the Tangent Bound Network. They are our servers. And to our season entertainment sponsor, Axtel Expressions. We talked about both of them at the top, and I hope you'll go check out their site. Signing off for Talk for Two, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding everyone out there to keep talking for two. You can hear more show business interviews with the stars at talkfor2.com, where you'll also find one-of-a-kind products to improve your own show. That's Talk the number four, TWO.com.